So at some point you might have been told that it's bad to have 90 degree bends in electrical wiring. And so in today's video I'd like to take a look at if that is actually true and why that might be the case. So first of all for those of you just interested in getting a quick answer I can tell you right away that a 90 degree bend in a wire is usually no problem at all. So you could just do that it, it's going to work just fine. Um, and in fact, a lot of you will have tried it and, and would have found that it does in fact work without any problems. But that does leave us with the question of you know, where does this advice of avoiding 90 degree bends, where does it actually come from? What is the reasoning uh, behind this? Now I think a big part of it comes from the world of electronic circuit board design or PCB design. Because if, if you look at PCBs, uh, rarely will you find any 90 degree bends on them and if you've ever gone on the internet and you know read advice about how to design circuit boards you'll find one of the most common pieces of advice is to avoid 90 degree bends at all costs. So first of all let's take a step back from PCB traces and just talk about a regular cable okay a cable that consists of uh, two wires. So a way that you can model a cable is as if it's this long string of connected inductors and capacitors which looks kind of like this. And there is something really interesting about that. So let's say that we have a cable, right, which again is essentially just a string of inductors with parallel capacitors along its length. Um, and let's imagine, for the sake of argument, that we have this cable uh, that is connected to a voltage source over here, but this cable is infinitely long, okay, so it doesn't have an end, it just keeps on going forever. Of course that doesn't exist, but let's say it does for now. Now what would happen if we turn this voltage source on? Well, the moment we turn this on, an electric current starts flowing because it's going to charge up this capacitance right here. But at some point that capacitance is fully charged and so it's going to charge up the next one and so on and so forth. And so it's going to create essentially this wave of charge rolling down the cable which happens at the speed of light. But of course in this particular case that cable is infinitely long so that charging process just keeps on going forever uh, and it never ends. So that also means that the electric current from this voltage source keeps on flowing because it keeps on charging that cable and it's never quite done. And so as seen from this voltage source it just looks like we've hooked up a resistor to it because the current just keeps going. How does it know whether it's an infinitely long cable or just some resistor that we hooked up to it, right? And now here comes the important part. The value of that resistor, of that virtual resistor that represents this infinitely long cable, that is the characteristic impedance of the cable. So that is what characteristic impedance is. If you have like a coax cable that you use to hook up a TV or something like that, you might have seen that it says on that cable, uh, you know, characteristic impedance 50 ohms or characteristic impedance uh, 75 ohms or something like that. That's what this means, right? It means that if that cable uh, was infinitely long, that would be the impedance that the voltage source would see at the very start of that cable. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's take a look at a little bit more specific example now. So let's say that this voltage source at the start has a maximum voltage of 5 volts. So when you turn it on, the voltage of this thing is going to be 5 volts. There we go. Also, the characteristic impedance of our cable, uh, we're just going to assume is 50 ohms. That is Zc, the characteristic impedance of the cable. Now, the characteristic impedance of a cable depends on how much capacitance there is between those wires and how much inductance there is. And so it depends on the physical characteristics of the cable, right? The, the way that it's constructed and the, the materials that are used, etc. So that is why on every specific cable that you buy, at least if it's relevant for the type of cable, like you wouldn't see it on a power cord, right? But if you buy a coax cable, it says you're 50 ohms, 
then you know that this thing's specifically made to have that characteristic impedance. Okay, also let's assume that the internal resistance of our voltage source is also 50 ohms. So we're just going to say 50 right there. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to turn on this voltage source and we're going to plot the voltage in this point right here at the start of the cable in this chart. So we have voltage on the vertical axis, time on the uh, horizontal axis. What will happen to the voltage in this point? Well, initially, when we turn on this voltage source, we have a 50 ohm internal resistance connected in series with a 50 ohm uh, characteristic cable impedance. So we just have a 50-50 voltage divider. So the voltage here is going to be halfway in between 0 and 5, so it's going to be 2.5. So let's just draw that on our plot. We turn on the voltage source and the voltage goes up and let's say it reaches, you know, it's about right there. 2.5 volts. Perfect. Now, if this cable was infinitely long, then the voltage would now stay at 2.5 volts because the characteristic impedance would just stay 50 ohms. Nothing special there. But let's say this cable this time, it's not infinitely long, so it actually ends. And the end of the cable is connected to nothing. It's an open circuit, so an infinitely high uh, resistance or impedance. So in that case, what would happen is when that wave reaches the end of the cable, well, all of a sudden it runs into an infinitely high impedance, so the current stops because you know, there is nothing here. So the voltage at the end of the cable will rise up all the way to 5 volts, and that 5 volts will then roll back to the start of the cable, and eventually it reaches this point, and so our voltage shoots up to 5 volts, like this. And this is what you call a signal reflection. And Signal reflections are bad because they end up distorting the signal that you're trying to transmit. Now, what you can actually do is by looking at this delay here, you can work out the length of the cable, right? Because the wave rolls to the end of the cable at the speed of light, and then it rolls back at the speed of light, and so based on this time, you can work out how long the cable is. You can actually buy little devices that can test the length of cables uh, based on this principle. So you just plug it into one side of that cable, you turn it on and it works out how long the thing is. It's pretty cool. Okay, but if this reflection is bad, we want to eliminate it. So how do we eliminate it? Well, um, you eliminate reflections by having all elements have the same characteristic impedance. So in this case, the internal resistance of our supply and the characteristic impedance of the cable they are already matched, so that's good. We don't need to do anything about that. But the end of the cable is connected to nothing, right? It has an infinitely high impedance, which is not matched to 50 ohms. So the solution would be to add a 50 ohm resistor to the output. Just add a resistor, call it 50 ohms. And so in this case, once that charge reaches the end of the cable, the voltage is two and a half, Instead of running into an infinitely high impedance and the voltage rising up to 5 volts, this time the current can just continue to flow through that resistor. The voltage remains 2.5. We just get a nice clean 2.5 volt uh, square pulse. And this is usually called a termination resistor. Did I mention that? I, I'm not sure actually. This is called a termination resistor. So if you've ever wondered what that means, that's what it is. It's a resistor that has the same characteristic impedance as your cable, and it is used to eliminate uh, reflections. Now, this also applies if you're going to connect multiple cables in series. So let's say instead of terminating it here and having the receiving device connected right away, let's say we're going to have another cable because we want to extend the length of some, something like that. In that case, that second cable would also have to have a 50 ohm characteristic impedance. If it has a different characteristic impedance, let's say we use a cable that is 75 ohms or something like that, well then that's going to introduce a reflection at the start of that second cable. So if you're going to use multiple cables, again they all also always have to use uh, matched impedances. Okay, so that was kind of a long story. This is where we get back to the PCB trace that we were talking about. 
So let's say that we have a trace on a circuit board like this, a corner, a 90 degree corner. Now the thing about this corner is essentially the width of the trace is larger than it needs to be in this bend, right? Because if we go like this, you can see that actually you only need it to be that wide to maintain a constant width. And so essentially this is additional metal that we don't necessarily need. And that metal gives this corner extra capacitance. So the corner has more capacitance than the rest of a trace. But we just saw that the amount of capacitance is important in how much characteristic impedance something has. And so in this case, the corner would have a different characteristic impedance from the rest of that trace. And so that could cause a reflection, which is why it's a good idea to avoid corners like this on a circuit board. However, there is something important to realize about all this. All of this stuff about reflections um, and characteristic impedance is only relevant if the period time of your signal is similar to the propagation delay across the cable that you are using. So in other words, if the wavelength of the signal uh, is in the same order of magnitude as the physical length of the cable. And in a, in, in a lot of situations, you'll find that is simply not the case. So even at a reasonably high frequency, like let's say 100 megahertz, 100 million cycles or pulses per second, the wavelength is still about three meters. So if you talk about PCBs, like little circuit boards, which are in the sort of centimeter scale, um, for this stuff to matter, you need to be dealing with gigahertz type signals. So while this can be an, an issue that you need to deal with, it usually only happens if you have very long cables, which you don't have on a circuit board, because circuit boards are usually pretty small, or you need to be dealing with very high frequency signals, which in a lot of electronic circuits is simply not the case. So even on a PCB, in most cases, for electronics that don't use very high frequency uh, signals, uh, using 90 degree corners is, is absolutely fine. Of course, none of this is relevant when it comes to power wires, because in the case of power wires, they always operate at super low frequencies. We're talking 50, 60 hertz, or even DC. Uh, so reflections play absolutely no role here. But there are some other reasons to avoid bending wires 90 degrees. So, for example, one point that is often made is that if you bend a wire super tight, essentially you're stretching one side of that wire. And so you might be causing microscopic cracks uh, in the material, which could increase the resistance of the wire in that spot. Practically speaking, though, um, I don't think, at least for most types of wires, that you'd ever notice a significant change in the resistance from bending a wire like this. Um, maybe if you bend a wire back and forth a whole bunch of times, you could, you know, damage the material enough for it to start making a difference. But usually folding a wire into a 90 degree bend is not really an issue. Another point that I've seen people make is that it could damage the insulation layer on the wire. And this is actually sort of a good point. Uh, but it particularly applies if you're using metal tools to fold the wire. So if you're using some kind of steel tool to fold a wire into a really, really sharp bend, there's a reasonable chance that you're actually damaging the, the insulation coating on the wire. And that could be a safety risk. So in general, I'd say a 90 degree corner in a wire is usually no problem. Just make sure that you don't damage the wire in any way. As long as you do that, you should be absolutely fine. So there you go. That is sort of the, the backstory, at least as far as I know, uh, on why people don't like 90 degree corners in wires. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, then maybe consider subscribing to this channel. Uh, and of course, thank you very much for watching.